welcome to the Business Leadership Series, where we engage with leaders who are making an impact on their worlds and who want to share their knowledge and experience for your personal and professional growth. The following interview is designed to inspire you to become the best leader you can be. Your host, Derek Champagne, is the founder and CEO of The Artist Evolution, a full-service agency building successful brands, marketing tools, and campaigns, and also the author of the best-selling book, Don't Buy a Duck. And now, let's begin today's Leadership Series interview. Welcome to the Business Leadership Series, where our goal is to inspire you to become the best leader that you can be. I'm excited about our guest today, Oscar Tromboli. He is on a quest to create 100 million deep listeners in the world. That's awesome. Author, host of the Apple award-winning podcast, Deep Listening. He's a sought-after keynote speaker. He's passionate about using the gift of listening to bring positive change in homes, the workplace, and the world. So through his work, with chairs, board of directors, executive teams, and local, regional, and global organizations. He's experienced firsthand the transformational impact leaders and organizations can have when they listen beyond the words. He's consulted organizations including Cisco, Google, HSBC, News Corp, PayPal, Qantas, TripAdvisor, and more, helping executives and their teams to listen to what's unsaid by the customers and the employees. He lives in Sydney, Australia. Oscar, it's a privilege to have you on with us today. G'day, Derek. I'm looking forward to listening to your questions. Hey, well, we always like to start by just getting to know our guests a little bit better. So just tell us about you, you as a, as a person, any highlights in your journey, so we can just get a good idea about who, uh, who you are and what you're about. Yeah, I won the genetic lottery. I was born in, in Sydney, Australia, the son of <laughs> two first-generation migrants from post-war Italy, one of my mom from the deep northeast of Italy and my dad from the far south of Italy. They never would have met unless it was in Australia. And I was really fortunate because I grew up in an area that had many nationalities. And I went to a school with 23 different nationalities, which meant lunches were fantastic. You could swap pretty much with Eastern Europe, North Asia, <laughs> South America, and, uh, you know, those boring kinds of lunches. That was never a problem. And, uh, and at high school, uh, we were always playing card games. And the card game that was most popular in our school was an Italian card game called Briscola. Now, I can only speak English. I didn't have the opportunity to learn another language. But those I played against, you play in teams of two against each other. I was always the pickup player. The people that were short of a player would put me in their team. And what you often had was nationalities competing against each other in these card games, Derek. Wow. And what I learned very early on was I couldn't count cards, but I could read body language. I only figured that out afterwards when I, I had to rely on another skill to be successful at this game we probably played too many too many card games we probably even played card games during class but don't tell our <laughs> teachers okay and uh well, my dad had a great work ethic he he always said i you can't be the smartest in the room all the time but you can always be the hardest working and and i kind of took that to heart and he said um, son, you know, there's no one in our family ever gone to college, to university. Um, if you become an accountant, uh, you'll never be out of work. Um, how ironic those words are in the in the age of computing because mm. accountants are one of the jobs under threat. And I, I did. I went to university. I, I got a, a cadetship, as it was called then, a, a junior in an accounting firm. But only six weeks in, my manager pulled me aside and said, Houston we have a problem and the problem I had was I had this thing called dyscalculus so if you read out three different numbers to me like 913 or 319 I would write them around the wrong way hmm. and he basic in that moment my accounting career was completely over but that created an opportunity for me to reinvent myself in 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 that moment because of the kindness of of my boss and his boss who pulled me aside and said look you're a hard worker what do you know about computers and I said, honestly, absolutely nothing. And they said, great, that honesty will be perfect for what we need in <laughs> putting these computers in. And off we went. And, and you know, my, my corporate career ended up as a marketing director at Microsoft three decades later. Wow. And uh, an amazing journey and uh, having fun along the way. But everybody always said to me, um, the way you listen is really different. So thus the quest to 100 million deep listeners in the world. 
and you thank you for sharing that first of all i i love that you had uh had some leadership that allowed you to reinvent yourself uh i love that example that's great um i'm sure that that made a major impact on you T- tell me though let's go back to the to the diversity that you had in your school and these card games what do you think it was that that made you recognize that the 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 body language, like what, what was that skill set? Like, let's dig into that just a little bit more because that, that is, I'm assuming is the foundation of, of what you're teaching now. Yeah, I didn't know it at the time. It was definitely the foundation and I did it unconsciously and difficulty cool kids and the popular kids were, and I was kind of not because I didn't speak another language and I was forced into how, how, how do I learn faster? And I was watching, head tilts i was watching shoulder and spine movement i was watching breathing i was watching where their fingers were on the cards i was watching how they were watching each other and the other card players and then i was pattern matching because what i couldn't do was see the cards but then i would have to notice the card they played and try and go ah okay so that 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 consistent way they tilt their head that's when they've got a card that's a a rubbish card or that's the card they've got that's a good card or or or, oh okay so the the players played diagonally so you you, the team was diagonally across a foursome Mm. so you know you you had to keep your eye on both players and you know i always talk about the fact we have um, peripheral vision but we also have peripheral hearing and Hearing not so much useful, but what I also started to listen for was not um, how the Vietnamese kids or the or the Polish kids or, or or the kids from Argentina were speaking. I really couldn't understand their language, but I picked up a bit along the way. W- what I was listening for was their inclination in their voice, hmm. and, and, and did their voice change when their card, uh, when their eye movements were different, when they were talking to the other player about what card they wanted to play and things like that. And I think at the end of the day, not having the ability to know the words uh, was actually an advantage for me because right. I could then I, I could concentrate on something they weren't concentrating on. Because that, that also made me invisible because I didn't speak the language. Um, you know, the person I was playing against couldn't say it in English because the guys from Argentina could understand it. So we were playing silent diagonally and we were relying on, I guess, subtle movement and things like that. Um, I wouldn't say I was a great player or the teams I were in were wildly successful, but we were definitely better than um, the teams who were um, relying just on their... Um, home language skills in that case hmm. and uh and a bit of deception also i would say uh, <laughs> a, a lot of people pretended they they weren't going so good with the cards or they had better cards than they did but the the reality was their eyes definitely always gave it away hmm. and no matter how they tried to protect it the, the eyes were the windows to the soul when it came to the card games I find that really fascinating. Let's let's fast forward to this deep listening and applying it to today. You you talk about that despite the fact that 55% of our time is spent listening, it's a skill that only 2% of people really grasp and that there's these astonishing costs of failing to do so from miscommunication to job turnover to lost sales and that if public speaking is a skill of the 20th century that learning how to listen is important skill in the 21st century. Can we start, can we talk about some of the levels of listening and, and apply it now to, to today? Yeah, I think the more senior you are, the more likely that you're going to be spending more of your time listening, whether that's in the workplace or, or for customers, uh, even suppliers or employees. So the, the bigger the impact you have, the more, more of your day you spend listening. So people in, the people in my research database, 1,400 people, the most senior ones of those have said that they, they can spend up to 80% of their day just listening, but none of them ever got taught what plus, divide, subtract, division is as, as it relates to listening. So the five levels of listening is a way to help us understand how, how do we code listening? How do we understand the code of listening? And it started with a story where Tracy 
who was my vice president at Microsoft, we were in a in a very complex budget negotiation between Seattle, Sydney, and Singapore over video conference in about March of twenty twenty uh, of twenty twelve, hmm. and at the twenty minute mark, Tracy looked across me in the room and said, "Oscar, we need to talk after this meeting." And I always remember it was the twenty minute mark because she reminded me of it later. And for the rest of that 90-minute meeting, all I could think about is how many weeks' salary have I got in my bank account? <laughs> so I'm, sh I'm surely going to get fired because when the vice president said we need to talk after this meeting, that's not a good thing. Hmm. But the meeting concluded actually a little bit early and um, what, what, ha what happened at the 20-minute mark probably contributed to that. And Tracy took me aside at the end of the meeting and I sat down and all I could, I'm just counting, yeah, I think it's four weeks of salary. <laughs> And she said, at the 20-minute mark, I want to talk to you about the 20-minute mark. And I said, sure, sure, Tracy, yeah. She said, you, can, you, you have no idea, but you completely changed the direction of the meeting by the way you were listening. If you could code that, you could change the world. And wow. the, only thing, the only thing was in my head at the time, because all I was worried about was my bank account, and I was waiting for her to say, you're fired after that. And I, all I could get out of my out of my mouth was Tracy do you mean code or code code and she looked at me quizzically and she just said code now when you're at Microsoft that means write this into software hmm. and, and, and eventually that journey will take place where the kind of listening skills that we talk about today in the five levels of listening came out of that moment where Tracy could see something in me and this skill, it wasn't a skill about oration. It wasn't a skill about being a, a, a really persuasive speaker. It was just the capability to draw the group just to listen to themselves a little bit more and in a different way. And I walked out of that room, Derek. I never thought about it again until four weeks later where our chief operating officer and chief financial officer said to me um, can you come into our team meeting I want you to watch how I listen and I went oh have you been talking to Tracy and he said yeah <laughs> and for, so they for wanted my, you to observe they wanted you to observe how they were listening yeah and look at like, that I, wow <laughs> I, I said Brian I got a day job here you know I had a big job I, I was I was responsible for the biggest division in, in in the Australian business at that time from a revenue production perspective hmm. um, you know it was a it was nearly a billion dollars US I was responsible for a reseller network of over 10,000 people hmm. and I had a busy job and these people are saying come and watch come and watch me listen and I'm going <laughs> oh. Anyway, so I sat in those rooms and what I started to realize is I had to take what I was doing subconsciously and code it into these five levels of listening. So these five levels hmm. of listening are listening to yourself, number one. Most people think you've got to start with the speaker. You actually need to start with yourself. Level two, listening to the content. Level three, listening for the context. Level four, listening for what is unsaid. And then level five is listening for meaning and they're each a progressive you it's very difficult to access the next level of listening if you haven't got a strong foundation on the level below it and for most people in our research database Derek they stuck at level one 86 hmm. percent of people say they're stuck at level one because of their cell phone their laptop their iPad something that beeps and buzzes and notifies them that is the biggest barrier to most people's listening. Many people think it's about being fixated on the speaker, but most people turn up to the conversation with a story in their head about the last meeting, the next meeting, a chore they have to do on the weekends and travel arrangements, um, a bad experience they had with this person last time. In fact, it's happening for people listening right now. They're completely distracted listening to us. Hmm. And what I want to do is just invite you back in and explain the 125 400 rule, which means I speak at 125 words a minute. You listen at 400 words a minute, so you genetically programmed, you're neurologically programmed. The neuroscience says that you're going to be distracted straight away because you're filling in the gap for 300 words 
in your head because I'm not speaking fast enough. Now, horse race callers wow. and cattle auctioneers, they get up to 200 words a minute, but reality is we can we can listen to up to 400 words a minute. So we drift. We, we drift either into their story and go and find a time where we had a story in common and we drift and we find a story that's different. And it's happening right now for people listening. It's like, oh, this guy's got a weird accent. When was the last time I heard a weird accent like this? <laughs> so, so listening to yourself is really the critical starting point. And, and there's three tips I'd always give, Derek. Number one, get rid of those distractions. Number two, drink water. A hydrated brain is a listening brain. The brain processes listening at the most modern part of the brain, the prefrontal cortex, the part of the brain that's immediately behind the skull. And a lot of people say my brain hurts when they listen. And the reality is they're actually dehydrated. Wow. The brain is 5% of body mass, yet it consumes 26% of blood sugars. And when you're doing a complex task like listening, if it's hydrated, you're giving your brain a better chance. And then finally, tip number three, the deeper you breathe, the deeper you listen, most people aren't even conscious of their breathing. So with three deep breaths, and I'm not talking about a yoga pose and <sighs> not that kind of stuff, just in through your nose, down the back of your throat, all the way down to the bottom of your lungs, exhale through your mouth, do that three times, and you're going to be in a state that's ready to listen. The way I make that work for me, Derek, is I just, when I go into a lobby of a building to see a customer or a, or, or a client or a supplier, I switch my cell phone off, I put it in my bag, I get into the elevator. If there's nobody in the elevator, I'll do this with my eyes closed. If there's someone in, in, in the elevator, I'll just look at my shoes, I'll take three deep breaths, and then when I get to reception and they offer me refreshments, I always ask for a jug of water, not just for me, but also for those people who are in the meeting. And those three things are really easy to do, but they're really hard to practice. Wow, great tips. Thank you so much, Oscar. Uh, I was practicing my breathing while I, and I was focusing, but I was doing my deep breaths as I was listening uh, to, to, just to try it out for myself. I love that. I mean, those, those are great tips. We've got a few minutes left, man. I would, I'd love to pick your brain all day on this is so great, but can you get us into one more level? I mean, you, you talked about the five levels, listen to yourself, listen for content, listen for context, what's unsaid for meaning. Um, yeah, remove I, distractions, I think, drink water, breathe deeper. What a few other tips. I mean, I'm I'm taking big notes here because these are such practical things and what a game changer it actually is. Imagine if my team was doing this internally with each other and with our vendors and with our clients. I I get it. Yeah, look, uh, 3 years ago one of the biggest changes Google implemented in meetings for more than 6 people is they have 1 minute of silence at the beginning of the meeting. Some leaders have a guided meditation that they do with that, but most leaders at Google, and it's the most commented on thing in terms of improving meeting productivity, but also employee engagement. For you as executives and business owners and entrepreneurs out there, level four, listening for what's unsaid. This is the ninja move if Yoda from Star Wars was sitting down with us around a little log fire. He'd be saying to us, listen for what's unsaid, which is completely counterintuitive. But another rule about the neuroscience of listening, I speak at 125 words a minute, yet I have 900 words per minute stuck in my head. So I think at 900 words per minute on average, some people can think way up to 1,500, 1,600 words per minute on average. So if you think about the maths of this, Derek, the, the, there's an 11% chance, one in nine, that the first thing that comes out of somebody's mouth is what they actually mean. So a skillful leader won't try and engage in the dialogue or on the first thing that people say. Here's three things you can practice to explore what's unsaid. And when you do this, what you'll notice is people will take a deep breath, they'll sigh, their shoulders will change position, and they'll go, well, actually, Derek, what we should be talking about is, or they'll say, hmm, well, what I meant to say was, hmm. or they'll say, hmm, now I've had time to think about it a little longer, we should be talking about this rather than that. So here's the three phrases you want to get awesome at practicing, and they're really simple phrases. First phrase is, tell me more. Next phrase, what else? And the third phrase, you need to lean in and listen carefully. This is one's a little bit more complex. Here it is. So don't worry, I didn't drop out. It's silence. 
So in the West, uh, we have an awkward relationship with silence. We call it the awkward pause. We call it the pregnant pause. We call it the deafening silence. In the East, in ancient cultures, in, in great traditions of storytelling and story listening, the Inuit of North America, Chinese, Korean, Japanese, the ancient tribal cultures of Africa and South America, and in Australia, the Aboriginal and the Polynesian Islanders and the Maori cultures, uh, silence, it's a sign of wisdom, it's a sign of authority, and it's a sign of respect. Now, what happens, Derek, if you ask these or use these three really simple phrases, that person will start to think about what's really critical because the likelihood that the first time they say something is what they mean, you've got better odds going to Las Vegas on a roulette wheel, to be honest, than you have of getting a great conversation going with the first thing they say. If I went to my doctor, Dr. John, and he said to me, hey, good news, Oscar, you've got an 11% chance of surviving the surgery. <laughs> you know, I'd be asking for a second opinion. I'd be asking for a third opinion, a fifth. I want to get it up to about 50%. That would be handy. Yet mm. most of us in our working life and in our home life have very superficial conversations about the first thing that comes out of people's mouths and what we're not listening is beyond the words as to what they really mean. So those three tips are, tell me more, what else? And just pause, use silence, let it do the heavy lifting. And what our database has told us is if they practice this consistently, they get four hours a week back in their calendar because they're not repeating things. They're not going back into project meetings and saying, no, that's what I actually meant last week. You've brought back the wrong deliverable. Or they, they're winning more customers because they're listening for where they can help rather than where they can sell. So helping the customer understand that you may be the right match for their organization or not but listening for where you can help beyond the current conversation is what makes a huge difference as well at level four. Hmm. There's so much there, Oscar. I, I really appreciate your wisdom. I love that. Let the silence do the heavy lifting. Wow. That is really powerful. I wish I could talk to you all day on this. Uh, we're out of time today. Can we talk though about how can our listeners learn more about you and what kind of resources you have? Uh, I'm ready to roll up my sleeves and learn more. And really simply, if you go to listeningmyths.com, at listeningmyths.com, you can get the research, you can get uh, the jigsaw puzzle game you can play, you can get the playing cards, you can get the book, you can get access to the research, you can get access to the Apple Award-winning podcast, you can set your own adventure from there. But if you visit listeningmyths.com, that's the gateway to starting down this path. Oscar, truly appreciate you taking time today. I've learned so much from you. I've got page, two pages of notes here, even though I was listening, but I didn't want to miss anything here. Uh, I really appreciate it. Uh, listeningmyths.com. Oscar, thank you. And man, I look forward to getting into that. And thank you for your time today. Thanks for listening. You've been listening to the Business Leadership Series, where we engage with leaders who are making an impact on their worlds and who want to share their knowledge and experience for your personal and professional growth. This interview was designed to inspire you to become the best leader you can be. 